so that we have plenty of time for questions and discussions, I'd like to make a start now on this session on making science public. Uh, the subtitle, Data Sharing, Dissemination, Public Engagement with Science, suggests we've got a lot of ground to cover in the time we've got available to us. Uh, very briefly, so you know whom you've got in front of you, I'd, uh, I'll introduce myself and the panelists, uh, and then we'll come back to them to give you a bit more background on where they're coming from. My name is Felix Reed Sohas, and I'm on the faculty of the Institute for Science Innovation Society here at the Side Business School. Uh, with me on the panel, uh, to my far right, we've got Ben Goldacre, who uh, is a doctor uh, and is probably best known for his bad science blog on The Guardian, which I presume uh, at least a number of people in the audience will be familiar with. Uh, directly to my right is uh, Maxine Clark, uh, who is publishing executive editor for Nature and has been involved in a number of Nature's uh, social networking activities, blogging activities. And then to my left is uh, Cameron Nalen, uh, who uh, was uh, centrally involved in a BBSRC-funded project called the Lablog System, which is very much in the vein of open science, and who also runs a blog called Science in the Open. But I'll give them an opportunity to say more about themselves in just a moment. Um, just to delineate the sort of territory that we're going to try to cover in this uh, session, um, clearly for science, new technologies are bringing along some very fundamental and massive changes. One set of questions one could see as involving the relationship between scientists and the public. Uh, so that's a dialogue that traditionally has been mediated by uh, traditional forms of science journalism, but seems to be changing quite radically. And it's not just the channels of, of interaction that are changing, but it's possibly also our conceptions of these two groupings, the scientists and the public themselves, that are changing as well. And the second broadly delineated topic that um, uh, we, we will be wanting to uh, touch on with, with, with a number of questions are essentially what one could see as the new modes of knowledge production and collaboration that are enabled by these sorts of tools, and also to some extent how these tools uh, engage, modify uh, scientific debate. So um, as you can see, that's a not unambitious remit. So I'll kind of, I'll try to cut from the, my introduction straight to the speakers uh, in a moment. And um, I thought it would be useful before we cut to the questions uh, to just have a, a, a bit more of a sense than my, my one sentence biographical sketch allows as to where the panelists are coming at this topic from. And so perhaps simply for simplicity, starting in the same way at the far right, uh, Ben, if you could perhaps just give a bit of background to, 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 as, as to where, where you've arrived at this from. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a medical doctor and um, very small time academic. Um, and I've written since 2003 about dodgy science, bad science claims from industry um, and particularly from the media. And it's my view that mainstream media covers science very badly um, and that you know, direct, unmediated communication between scientists and the public is a much better way to go. Um, and that's something I had a bit of a shouty fight with the science minister about on Wednesday at the Royal Institute in a debate there. Thanks, Ben. Um, Maxine? Um, well, uh, I just thought I'd give my Twitter my, um, name, which is Maxine Clark. Maxine underscore Clark, because there's a few of us about. Um, but don't forget the E. It's not that. Um, so I've been asked to speak about a bit about how blogging and other social media have um, changed the publication process. Um, and as an editor for the science journal Nature, I thought I'd give a very quick overview of our publication process there. So we provide three essential services for scientists who are our readers, authors, potential authors, and peer reviewers. We try to identify the most arresting advances in science, which we publish either as original research or as news or reviews. We, try, we provide quality and trust for our readers, and we provide accessible and fast communication of results. And while it's true that social media have changed some aspects of these processes, so far as the publication of original research is concerned, I would say that they haven't made a significant impact. 
mainly um, a leading journal like Nature is overwhelmed with manuscript submissions and internet-enabled pre-submissions about whether we'd like people's manuscripts. Um, and we employ professional editors who are ex-scientists to select a very highly filtered set of papers to publish. And the main editor tasks being to identify which papers those are out of the slew, to, to find the best peer reviewers to judge the technical merit, and to manage a fair and fast assessment system. Now, there's been various social media experiments um, with this process over the past few years. Nature's done a few, other journals have done a few. Um, but basically, the peer review process in virtually all scientific journals um, is the same as, um, as the one that went on before the internet. It might be interesting to um, explore why that is. <clears throat> so, some journals now are um, opening up the peer review process in a more systematic way um, by posting the peer reviewer's comments and the author's response on the online version of the paper when it's published. But the vast majority of scientists don't communicate, don't contribute to these online forums. Um, so the scientific community itself, in the main, seems to be quite conservative as far as social media are concerned. Most professional scientists seem to like to discover new fields and subfields by interacting with each other at conferences um, or talking to each other. And they actually have to be encouraged, sometimes very hard, to do things such as deposit their papers in an online repository um, or write a technical comment on an online version of a paper. So although there's lots of talk going on about science, either in the real world or on the internet or wherever, um, not much of it's actually happening in the form of an engaged conversation between the author of the paper and people who are reading it um, at the website where the paper's published, which, which is leading some journals to um, provide sort of online sharing tools and links to discussions going on elsewhere. Having said all that, I think um, there certainly are ways in which journals can and do help to stimulate scientific developments using social media as part of the formal publication process, that is. And I think these come before the formal submission process and after the publication. So before an author submits um, their manuscript to a journal, I think journals should be encouraging online conversation, criticism and refinement of the work before it's actually submitted to the journal. And a good example is a preprint server. There's a very um, well-established one in the physical sciences called Archive. And a couple of years ago, um, the Nature Publishing Group um, also has produced a preprint server called Nature Proceedings, where a scientist can upload a draft or a presentation or a poster or any document. It's tagged, it's provided with a unique identifier. And other users can go and comment online, rank the work, discuss it with the author, criticize it, and so on. And that's certainly one practice that journals, um, I think, should be encouraging, but in fact, many discourage it. Journals can also encourage scientists to share their data openly before publication, and genome sequencing is an example of a field where that's happened. Um, early release of data, rapid release of data, has stimulated the entire field. After publication, journals can also help by enforcing data sharing. At Nature Journals, where there's about 14 of our journals now, <clears throat> our policies are that we make authors um, who've published um, deposit their data in an online repository if there is one, or if there isn't one, make it promptly available to anyone who asks. And I think more journals should do this, and I think the scientific community needs to try to promote a culture of sharing data. We also um, encourage scientists to share more of their work online than can be covered in a single paper. So a nature paper now can, consists usually of three parts, a sort of roughly five-page print online version, which is all mo many readers have the stamina for. Then there's an additional online supplement where there's more methods, discussion, <coughs> figures, and tables, and that's attached online to the paper. But some people tell us that they want more than that, and that's not enough. So um, we invite um, all authors who are accepted for publication to um, upload their protocols or their recipes for their experiments into a free um, protocols network, which is run by one of our journals. And there, the um, author can upload their recipe, their exact steps of what they did. And other scientists um, who want to repeat the experiments can follow it, can annotate the um, protocol with their own variants, ask questions of the authors, and so on. <clears throat> So it's true that there are these sort of social media experiments going on around the conventional scientific pro um, publishing process. But um, 
And, you know, it's true that many scientists do blog and use Twitter and so on. But I would just say that the vast majority of scientists, in my experience, don't. They don't really use social media as part of their normal work. And um, I think it's all rather untried and rather new. And that's perhaps something we could talk about later. Thank you. In that case, if I could go straight over to Cameron, um, just to give us a sense where you come at this from. So, so I'm a, a practicing scientist. I, I have appointments both at a, an institute not far from here, at Rutherford Appleton Lab, and at the University of Southampton. Um, and in fact, I've skipped out the last half day of the international uh, meeting on small angle scattering to be, to be here. Um, so far, it's been a lot more interesting. Um, just don't, don't tell my boss that. Um, so I'm one of those people who are trying to get money to turn into science, science to turn into papers, papers to try and get past Maxine and into nature. Um, and so I'm probably sort of middling successful at that, heading towards the middle of my career, um, and therefore arguably fairly mediocre. Most of us are. Um, this is an incredibly competitive, ruthlessly competitive, and you're always looking for one way, any way, to get ahead of the game. And a colleague came to me about six years ago talking about you know, how we could perhaps do a better job of recording what we do in the laboratory. So having a laboratory notebook that was online that was more effective. And this appealed to me at that point because um, what I wanted to be able, what I thought I'd be able to get out of that was to have a better collection of data. I could go back into it and I could get more papers out of it. Um, this went on and we started a project and we developed a lab notebook system. It's fundamentally a blog. Um, the, the technical details aren't that important. But about halfway through this, I started also being at the Rutherford Lab. So this had started off in Southampton. And I couldn't get in. Firewall at Rutherford was just a nightmare. And I couldn't authenticate against Southampton servers. And this was just driving me absolutely up the wall. And so I said, well, OK, let's, let's just forget this. We're not, not going to hide it. We're just going to put it on the web. Anyone can see it. Straightforward. As you record it, what, what, what happens in the lab goes straight up in the lab notebook on the open web. And then I thought, ooh, that's a bit radical. <laughs> uh, the, you know, I'm not putting this through peer review. We're letting anyone see this so they can steal our data. Um, all sorts of things could, could go wrong here. But equally, all sorts of things could go right. We could find new collaborators. Um, we could actually have people check over our data, provide criticism. Um, people might actually use our methods because they could actually see what we'd done. Um, so it took me about five minutes to realise I wasn't the first person to think about this. And there was a small community at the time, um, people like Jean-Claude Bradley at Drexel University, Bill Hooker, Neil Saunders around the world, um, talking about these ideas, talking about making science truly open. Um, and encouraging this sort of communication. Again, at the same time, there was this sense of uh, utopian ideals about what the blogosphere could do. And we, you know, we, we met up through blogs. I still haven't met many of these people. I've met some of them. And we had these conversations, and that grew up. And then there was a, a second generation of tools and feed aggregators, things like FriendFeed. Twitter became a lot more popular. And there's been this incredible growth of a community. So what Maxine says is absolutely true. It's a very small percentage of working scientists, but it's a rapidly growing one. And there's a real sense of communicating effectively within that community. And I'm starting to see examples where we're getting, um, I'm, I'm getting personal real advantages. So I just want to give one example of that. So Jean-Claude Bradley came over and visited us summer last year. Um, we talked on a train between Southampton and London, actually coming back from visiting Nature Publishing Group, about whether we could set up a project. We came up with a, a project which we thought was sort of feasible, where we could just publicise the details and ask people to go out and do measurements for us. Um, sort of simple laboratory experiments, the kind that an undergraduate chemist could, could go and do. Um, so the traditional approach for doing science is that you spend six months writing a grant, it gets rejected, uh, you rejig it, change the name, put it back into the funding council. And about 18 months to two years after you've started this process, you might start the project. You then finish the project two years later. You write up the papers and you send them on to Maxine uh, and then get rejected and go down to a bunch of other journals. Um, That's why I love coming to conferences. <laughs> <laughs> so 
We started this project, we announced the project in about October, November last year. Uh, we had essentially no funding. Um, a group called Submajor actually gave us some money to uh, provide prizes on a monthly basis for the students. Um, Nature Publishing Group provided um, journal subscriptions for each of the uh, students who got one of the prizes. We started the project in October. We submitted an invited paper in January. That's now been published by O'Reilly in a, in a book called Beautiful Data. Um, and we've turned around a project in around about six months uh, with no funding. And that, to me, is a more efficient, more effective way of doing science. So presumably, most of you are taxpayers. <laughs> you pay my salary. Thank you very much for that. Um, but I've, I feel it's incumbent on us as scientists to make sure we spend that money and the money that goes on research efficiently. Um, and there are tremendous potentials for increasing efficiency through more effective collaborations, through more effective ways of distributing the work of science and through more effective ways of funding it, which I imagine we can discuss and argue about for the next 45 minutes without too much trouble. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just a note about... Um, a sort of housekeeping note of, of how I think it might be easiest to run this. Um, we have a set of questions for the panelists, and we'll have to see to what extent we get through those. Um, and I think what would be useful so that we can maximize the input we also get from the audience is, um, I'll give a question to a panelist or some panelists. Um, I will then invite the other panelists to come in with any additional comments, and then I will then open up to Q&A from the audience and response from the panelists, and then we move on to the next question, so that rather than bunching questions from the audience at the end, we do that throughout the session. So in that vein, and um, this question is something that I probably have Ben in mind. Um, there's been a lot uh, recently press coverage, if I think about uh, the death or the demise of science journalism which is uh, seen as, as a traditional link or one of the potential traditional links between the public and scientists. And on the other hand, social media provide this vibrant new channel for providing some sort of direct link. And so question to you would be, uh, do you think that uh, this, this, this move to, say, the blogosphere as a way of having scientists and the public interact, is this a transformative change? Is this, just a different, um, is this just a different choice of channels of communication? Um, how different are the characteristics of these sorts of interactions to the ones we are perhaps more accustomed to previously? Well, I, I think it's a very different way of, of interacting between scientists and the public, and I think it's got a lot of advantages. I mean, there's plenty of, of perfectly good science journalism out there, especially by specialist health and science journalists. But there's also uh, a lot of disappointments. There are a lot of cases where, where science journalists and generalists get things very obviously wrong, um, but they also dumb down. There's no, kind of, there's no room for, for niche communication um, for, for people who are interested in nerd issues in mainstream media anymore. Um, and I don't particularly mean professional scientists reading about the work of other professional scientists. The, the people who are really neglected are the people who did you know, behavioural neuroscience at Nottingham University and now work in marketing for a social media company or something. Um, and I think it's a real problem if we don't give people like that interesting science-y content that will maintain their nerd capital, that will sort of keep them intellectually stimulated and, and remind them of why they were interested in science um, in the first place. There are a number of things that blogs can do very, very well. Um, firstly, they can make a kind of two-pronged attack on mainstream media because they can, they can show where they get stories wrong and they can also sort of lead the way for, for doing things better. But also... They have sort of structural advantages. Firstly, as I said, they can be niche. You know, um, many of them aren't. Mind Hacks, which I think is one of the best um, science blogs out there, gets well over 100,000 unique visitors a week, and it's fantastic. It's, it's my go-to source for stuff about, um, about neuroscience and psychology, and it's written by somebody who works in the field, who works in the same place I used to work at. Um, and that's a fantastic example of, of you know, how they can do it on a kind of big scale. But actually, there are lots of very fun blogs that are only read by 500 people or 1,000 people in a week. But if there are 2,000 of those, then that makes a million 
reading events in a week, and that's a sort of significant thing. And I think that shows the extent to which it will be worthwhile government, research councils, and other funding bodies thinking quite carefully about how they can set up structures that facilitate um, scientists communicating directly with the public. Last week, I didn't win the Royal Society Books Prize, although I was shortlisted, so I got a <laughs> cheque for a grand. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I don't mind not winning. Um, but the winner got 15 grand. So overall, they, got, they handed out £20,000 in prizes for science books, some of which I happen to know. And this, I mean, I'm not sort of, I'm not being critical about any, any of the books in this prize, but, but some of them sold no more than 3,000 copies. And it seems odd to me that the Royal Society is spending £20,000 in prizes and, and several thousand more in admin on something to reward public engagement, to reward people trying to enthuse the public about science for an activity like publishing, which is actually incredibly marginal and incredibly niche compared to the huge amount of attention um, that, that blogs get. Similarly, on Wednesday, as I said, I had a debate with Lord Drayson, the science minister, about problems with mainstream media and what we can do about it. And I was talking a lot about how we could um, promote more scientists engaging directly with the public, bypassing um, the, the sort of flaws in mainstream media by doing it themselves. And this is something which, which, which sort of government, it's, it's just, it's literally never occurred to them. They, they have a committee um, to look at the problems of, of science coverage in the media. And not a single person on that committee is anybody from anything to do with, with new media. There are lots of very good people. You know, they've got Roger Highfield, the editor of New Scientist. They've got all kinds, you know, um, uh, the chap who runs the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, who's in the parallel session next door that you're all following on that screen. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but nobody who works in, in new media, and I think that's really problematic because I think there are a lot of things that they could do. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say very briefly, because I'm trying not to go on... Uh, is I think there's something structural about writing about science on blogs and on the internet which uh, naturally leads you towards being uh, clearer and um, sounder in what you write. And that is that you, you can and generally do link directly to primary sources. And this is something that mainstream media goes out of its way not to do. Partly because, and this sounds conspiratorial, but I think it's valid, partly because journalists want to obfuscate on how it is that they write stories. They don't want you to know that the primary source for their story is a press release. They don't want you to see the press release because they don't want you to see the extent to which they've copied and pasted it. And they don't link to the direct academic journal article because often they haven't read that. Um, and you can tell that, you know. So, for example, uh, recently there was a big story about prostate cancer. You can read it on badscience.net. And there were two papers published at once in the New England Journal. One said prostate cancer screening works. The other said prostate cancer screening doesn't work. Work. There was an editorial that said, isn't this odd? We don't know, well, you know, how can we make these two findings commensurable? In America, it was reported as, we don't really know if prostate cancer screening works. In England, every single newspaper, they all said, prostate cancer screening works, why isn't the government funding it? Partly because they wanted an excuse to chip away at government, but partly, uh, it's very, very obvious, if you look at what they wrote, that they all took their coverage, they all took their lead from one press release from one, um, from one cancer charity. And if they had linked directly to their primary source, it wouldn't have been the New England Journal, it would have been the press release. But in their articles, they write it as if they're referring to the New England Journal. So by linking directly to primary sources, um, you're kind of forced to be a bit more sound. So, so just a couple of follow-up questions before I hand over to the... I mean, stylizing this a bit more sharply. Um, because some people, of course, would say this, this, this whole new mode of communication is a sort of last nail in the coffin of, of traditional science, science journalism. So is bad science journalism, <laughs> in, in, in some sense, is that worse than no science journalism? Is that, is, I mean, when people make this, make this observation, is that a valid point or, or, uh, or not? I, I think the really important thing is, is, is to have a patchwork my problem with all of the, the, the mainstream public engagement work that's done and often quite well funded by government and medical research charities is that it's all about a um, uh, very sort of broadcast model. It's, very, very, uh, it's all about being very dumbed down and, and trying to seduce what people often quite patronisingly uh, perceive as this great uninterested herd of people. We have to dumb down in order to grab everyone. And the one thing that they never do is produce things which are nerdy, niche and for people who aren't professional scientists but who are attentive and I think it's absolutely fine if people want to carry on doing their dumbed down stuff and their histrionic we're all going to die stuff but what's really great is that we can also have this niche stuff and it can work on um, 
I, uh, I don't know any better phrase than the shits and giggles economy. Um, it can work on goodwill. It can work on scientists who say, you know, I'm really, I'm really passionate about my work. I want to write a blog about it. I'm going to do it. And if people do want to do that, great. And if they don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine as well. Nobody's going to force scientists to publicly engage. Because I know that that's something they get very nervous about, especially with public discussions on academic papers. Um, I've heard people say, well, you know, we were going to submit this either to the BMJ or the Lancet, but the BMJ has these kind of raving anti-vaccination conspiracy theorists who post all these childish comments, and actually we, I couldn't really be bothered, you know. So, uh, you know, scientists are nervous about that. If they want to publicly engage, we should encourage that and facilitate it, and if they don't, then that's fine too. And then final question for me. Um, so so you, your column, in some sense, and what you're saying very clearly illustrates the dangers of sloppy science journalism. Um, but one of the issues in the, in, in, the, in the beginning panel was, of course, this issue of quality. And so if you think about this, this wonderful notion of the unmediated interaction between scientists and the public through blogs, how much is quality there? How much is trustworthiness an issue? I, I think this is really important. And it's something that comes up a lot when you talk to journalists. They, they respond by saying, essentially, the internet is this undifferentiated mush. And nobody can tell if things are good or bad. And I think if, if that's your position, then you really don't know how to use the internet properly. Um, the reality is there's good and bad coverage in mainstream media. There are, there are reliable and unreliable characters uh, in your local community, in flesh space. And it, it's often very, very easy to spot when somebody is an idiot or not an idiot. And also, even if there were some bad blogs and some misleading things out there, and I, and I really do believe that when, you know, I don't think the sort of the, the victim exploiter model really works in a lot of cases where people are being misled by vitamin pill peddlers or anti-vaccination conspiracy theorists. I think, you know, the risk factors for that are as much in the, the reader as in the writer. Um, but even if there are some, some dodgy things out there, fine, but there's lots of dodgy journalism too, and you know, I, I'm just all in favour of there being more, and you know, the street will find uses and the street will find ways for, for, for um, gathering and collating the good. Maxine, anything you'd yeah. like to add there? I, um, I'm, I'm an editor, you see, so I think that um, independent editing is a, is a very undervalued skill in this social media world. And um, so I don't equate a blog with science journalism in quite that way. But I completely agree that there's lots of excellent science blogs around. And since um, I started reading them, I've been really impressed with a, a large number of them. And the interactive element is so exciting um, as a reader, where you can actually interact directly with the author online of the blog and talk about the ideas. And the nerdish element is, is really right. You can find exactly those few people in the world who are interested in the same strange things that you're interested in. And I just wanted to say that um, bloggers, um, in my experience, are a very highly organized set of people, and they love writing and talking about blogging and organizing themselves. So if anyone doesn't know any good science blogs, um, They've organized themselves into an annual competition, and they produce a, a book whose name I have forgotten. Is it called Open Science? Or? Uh, it's called The Open Laboratory. The Open Laboratory. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a published on Lulu, the Publish On Demand um, service. And every year there's a, there's a competition, and any science blogger can, or anyone can nominate a blog post to this. And uh, these, these posts are collected together into a book. And they highlight a lot of really, um, really fascinating articles that um, bloggers have written, so I would recommend that. I just wanted to say very briefly something in praise of, of, of editors. I, I don't know if, if words like disintermediation are banned in conferences like this these days, um, but uh, I think the best place for popular science in mainstream media is Radio 4, and there's a structural reason for that, which is that 70% of the words in a Radio 4 documentary about science are spoken by the scientists themselves. And they're being shepherded Mm. onto the airwaves by, by professionals, by producers, by people who are editing their work down. They're being shepherded on, onto the airwaves by people who are saying, I'm not sure that's quite right. Can you, can you try and explain that in a slightly different way or a less complicated way? Um, and they're shepherded onto the airwaves by people who are making editorial judgments about what's, what's worth looking at and what's not. Um, but it's the scientists themselves speaking. And I think um, alongside kind of low-threshold, easy, quick, back-of-the-envelope web page 
training for scientists who want to engage publicly. I think also there's a real role for science editors, and, um, and it, it makes journalists very nervous, but you know, I, I, I'm fine with there being plenty of science writers out there, but what I'd really like to see is more science editors and, and fewer science writers proportionally, because I think getting professionals to help scientists speak in their own words is a much, much better way of doing things, because they don't get things so wrong, and the nuances and the distractions in their work are much richer. I was just going to say just sort of one thing, which is I heard a wonderful quote at a conference I was at about a month or so ago, which was we should ban the term the public from these discussions um, because we should just be dealing with people who may or may not be professional scientists, but that's not the distinction we need to make. So Arfon Smith, sitting up there in the, in the back, <laughs> was tweeting something, obviously, um, you know, has a community of, what, 140,000 members? 200. Some very large number of people classifying galaxies because they want to. And you know, we can engage people, we can engage people in the science. We can do this with projects that you know, really make people, make people be scientists, contribute to the science in a meaningful way. Um, they have papers where some of these people are going to be first authors coming out very soon. Um, and this is the way we can educate more widely people about, about how science works by having them involved in it. Uh, I, I think something really important that flows from that is um, interdisciplinary communication is something that people always talk about wanting to promote within all streams of academia. But actually, you know, it's only in that kind of grey academic sort of semi-professional scientists talking to each other on uh, uh, directly scientists talking to, the, to, the, to what we might want to call the public through blogs, that that, that can happen often because, you know, if, if I'm working in neuroscience and I want to find out something that's happening in epidemiology, there's not going to be enough on that for me in, in, the, in the science pages of the Times. And I'm not going to go and read their primary academic literature, but actually the kind of grey intermediary stuff is a really powerful way for that to happen. So I, I absolutely agree, you know, de-differentiating the public is a really important thing. Quick follow-up before I open to the audience, uh, to, to Cameron, just because uh, that seems a very important point. So are you saying, do you think that, that social media allow us to come to a much more differentiated and different notion of the public when we're talking about the engagement of science with the public? I think it's very easy, and you know, scientists are both arrogant and lazy, um, for the most part, when they think about other people. Um, and the, the, there is this very strong, you know, I can't be bothered doing this because they're all Daily Mail readers. Um, and that's, that's, a very that's a very strong attitude. I think that's something that has to be broken down, partly because it's not helpful, partly because um, we need to do a much better job of persuading people that maybe science is worth funding. And I say, this is, this is your money. If you don't believe in how we're spending it, if you don't even believe that we're making the right choices, we're going to go down the tube very quickly. Um, so I think it's very important to reach out to people in, in ways that, in things that interest them, which are different for different people. 90% of everything is crap, but that's a different 90% for every person. The, the, the questions from the audience have, of course, very clearly shown that trying to demarcate uh, dissemination of science from creation of science or creation of published versions of science is a fairly futile exercise because we've already moved into areas such as peer review. Um, one very brief uh, uh, question to, to, to Maxine, and now really the, the, the second area I'd want to cover in this uh, panel discussion is, is the question of um, are we moving to open source science? Are, 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 are these technologies enabling very different forms of generation of science? Um, and uh, sort of segueing into that, um, in particular because nature is using social networks and has introduced that. Um, a question to Maxine would be, um, how do you see blogs and social networks shaping scientific debates? And are, you know, are, is there a shift of scientific debates away from articles and letters in response and responses to letters and journals into blogs and social networks? How does that work? Well, um, as I mentioned, there are an um, you know, increasing number of journals now who are trying to um, who are publishing peer reviewer comments, um, peer reviewer reports, and, and the editing reports of the editing process online with the paper, and more journals are opening up their papers for online comments from readers. But, you know, readers don't comment. 
um, our, our nature's own um, experiment on open peer review, um, everybody who submitted to nature was given the opportunity to um, have their paper posted on a preprint server. And then we um, emailed um, all the people who sign up to Nature Publishing Group eAlerts, which is several hundred thousand people, um, and they tagged themselves by, um, by subject. So we, we um, emailed them and said, here's a paper in your discipline, would you like to comment? And, and hardly anybody did. So I think, you know, it's, I, I think it's just scientists are conservative and maybe um, we haven't much talked about rewards, but the way scientists tend to get um, uh, assessed is by um, the papers that they publish and the journals that they publish them in, and there's lots of things wrong with that system, and we could talk about that. But um, I think as long as that system is the dominant system, it's going to be quite hard to get people to um, comment openly on the social web about papers, about scientific research, before it's formally published somewhere. And I think you, you also get issues such as um, um, if you know, the power issue of if the person who submitted their paper is a, is a powerful um, senior scientist, then perhaps younger scientists um, would be less keen to um, put their names to criticising. I'm not quite sure if that's I guess, what I guess you... Condensing it down, would you say that, uh, do you see social media as in some sense following scientific debates, accompanying scientific debates, or can social media actually shape scientific debates? Well, I think they can. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're there technically yet. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a technical person, but, you know, you see um, um, nowadays in, in, in articles, not necessarily scientific articles, but every article in newspapers, you see all these um, little widgets where you can see the blog conversation that's going on about that particular article. And um, to me, it looks a little bit primitive. It's a bit clunky as a reader to try to absorb all this information. Maybe we'll develop better ways for um, conversations about um, a particular piece of research to be focused in one place. I feel at the moment, for me, um, I mean, I'm... I'm I'm not super technical, I'm not a geek, but I'm probably more technical than average. I find it just hard to find all those places at the moment. Um, and I think, we, I think we need to develop better ways to do that. Um, maybe the semantic web uh, will, will do that. Um, and also, um, another thing which I think um, journals like Nature do, and I hope, I hope others, is that we make our, our um, camera on, help me here, the, the, the text available for computer reading. Um, for, oh, for text mining. Yes, it's, it's got a four, four letters beginning yeah, with O, OMPI format or something. <laughs> so um, that's uh, the data, the data that nature, the, all the text that nature produces is freely available in XML format. So it's available there for text mining. And presumably, um, if that was more, wide, more widespread, then you could imagine um, a sort of focus developing where you could encourage more conversation. I just think there's conversation out there, but it's all a bit fragmented at the moment. It'd be nice to bring it all together in some way. I think, I mean, I think having, asking scientists to innovate around publication is just the wrong, it's the wrong part of the cycle to be, to be dealing with it, because that is where we are judged, that is where we me are measured on, that is what determines whether I get my next grant or not. It's just too high risk an area for someone to take a chance. Um, uh, Maxine mentioned plus one, full disclosure, I'm an academic editor. Um, and that's been really interesting because there are these perceptions about what the peer review process is. It's actually, in, in practice, it's actually very traditional. But the thing that make, that's made it successful is that it's indexed in PubMed, in Medline, which is, mm. that is the only criterion that a vast number of scientists care about. Whole sections of the scientific community are not using it because it's not indexed by the appropriate uh, computer science is one. It's not indexed by the standard computer science indexing services. That's what. So, you know, if you're not, don't fit into the indexing system. You, you, you're not going anywhere. The place and that's actually hampered a lot of um, online innovations. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but um, you know, PubMed has been or Medline has been very um, slow to pick up on the fact that online is respectable as a medium, and they, they have that. There's been this sort of attitude that if anything's online it's ephemeral and it's not ever going to be archived and so it's actually been quite difficult when when we've produced online publications to, to get them indexed because and i think that's now improving and changing but it has been a, an impediment i think to to scientific discourse i think where the innovation is happening is much earlier in the research cycle where we're having conversations trying to find collaborators i've seen a lot of 
familiar names sort of spiring up there, not people who are in the room, um, but people who are connected in various ways to us through various spooky, online scientific communities. Um, and that discussion of you know, how to set up a project, who should I be doing it with, is anyone interested in helping out, that, that kind of thing is changing. And I'm seeing, I say again from my personal perspective, starting to see real significant personal advantages in being hooked in to that community. Mm -hmm. Discussion of methods, sharing of data, um, sharing of the process of a project within a group of collaborators, um, vastly improved, much better ways of doing that today than they were even a few years ago. So those conversations, I think they are happening, but they're happening in a different part of the research cycle. Um, and they are fragmented, but that's a, that's a general problem on the social web, is the fragmentation of conversation. Um, I don't really need to see everyone's Facebook and Twitter comments and friend feed yeah. comments. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is a general problem across the whole sort of sphere. Can I just make two very brief points about sort of structural issues? Um, I think, firstly, one thing that would, will be really valuable, because I'm sure it will happen, is a structure for drawing together all of the strands of conversation about a particular paper or topic, because until that happens, and hopefully it will happen in an open way, um, it is, of course, very difficult to find the conversations. And the other structural issue is, um, and this is something that comes up a lot with the discussions around how wiki professionals should work, if anybody knows that, uh, is the issue of, of micro-credits. How can you give some mm, form of academic definitely. credit for academic activity, like making valuable suggestions in a, in a, in a peer review comment? How can you get some form of credit for that, which isn't a paper that counts in your RAE, but is still some kind of micro-credit? And I think that will also change things, because you know, scientists are fairly rational, and you know, if you get paid, they're not in it for money, but if you get paid in... Um, you know, linky love or uh, appreciation or, or CV points, then, then you're more likely to do something. Yeah, I agree. I think micro-attribution is a very big um, topic at the moment, and particularly in these big bioinformatics, big, bi big science topics, where a lot of people are working um, to produce data um, which somebody else is analysing and then perhaps publishing a paper on it. And um, micro-attribution to uh, afford credit. And also, you know, in Nature now, the average number of authors of a Nature paper is six. And we have some consortia where there's hundreds of authors, and I know high energy physics, that's peanuts. If you're in high energy physics, you have, I don't know, a thousand authors on a paper when you find the, uh, whatever the LHC is looking for or whatever. Um, yeah, so I think um, the, other, the other issue which um, we, uh, is, is relevant to the online is, is identity, author identity, and how um, uh, there's a lot of talk that goes on, and I know Cameron's involved in some of this, um, about identifiers and how you can um, be a true how you can have your um, your say your peer reviewing contributions and any other contributions that you make uh, attributed to you across the board and um, that's actually technically very challenging as well because it, it, um, of course all these systems and databases are, are, are independently run so there'd have to be some way by which this identifier was recognized but I think there's a lot of people thinking about this at the moment mm. I think there's, sorry, I was just going to say one, one, one sort of follow-up up to that is that we talk a lot about the fact we don't get credit for this, I don't get credit for blogging. I, hang on, I've been invited to sit on a panel session at an international conference. Uh, that goes on my CV. You know, I think there are, there, there, there are elements of this. It's done me, personally, a lot of good. Um, I say I'm a mediocre scientist, but arguably have a, have a worldwide reputation in, in the area of social media for science. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It certainly looks good on my CV. Science, science is the great open source endeavour. Uh, we build constantly on the work of others. If we can't, if, you know, and peer review in its broadest sense, what works, what happens, what can we build, what can we do that is useful, um, are things that require that the source, the methodology, the details, the data, the opinions, are available for discourse and that they can be replicated. We haven't even started talking about replication and the value of tracking things online. Um, if it, in a sense, at the core of it, I, if it's not open source in the sense that if I cannot, cannot replicate it or if I cannot check the details, it isn't science. And so we can only do better science involving more people more effectively the more we can make available in, a, in an effective